there. We've got a quorum, so we're going to get moving on our agenda for tonight. Um, pick up on some action items left over from uh, the last meeting where there wasn't a quorum and sorry, couldn't attend. And um, and then uh, we've got a few items. Uh, one is CAC coordination. It's follow on from some preliminary discussion we had with uh, Pierre and OVBVM at our retreat regarding a request for public uh, meetings and public presentations from Quebec and Vermont regarding Missisquoi Bay um, phosphorus reduction program and process and um, progress. And then dig into our action plan, uh, annual action plan uh, work. Uh, I think create a task force to do some work offline and, um, and start building that and then um, plan for December and January. So um, let me see, turn on my chat. I see someone's in the chat. Okay. Um, are there any public members? I only see I only see members and Pierre. Is that right? That's it. OK, then um, given there are no public other than members, we'll move beyond public comments. If someone comes in, we'll provide an opportunity for them to uh, weigh in. Um, our uh, two action items are the July 26th and October 10th meeting summaries. Um, we could do them collectively or individually, depending on whether folks have any edits. So um, I guess we can do them sequentially, um, but I'd need a um, motion to review and approve the minutes as presented. Uh, this is Eric. Oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. Whatever. Uh, just this is Eric. I'll make the motion. I'll second it. This is Carol. OK. Um, are there any edits or comments on them? As usual, I think they're excellent minutes. They capture the tone. I regularly get feedback from people um, that uh, they have a good sense of what happened in the meetings. Um, and. Uh, and I've received comment about them, you know, some of the substance of them for further discussion. So um, any any edits or comments for either? OK, all those in favor, I guess, uh, wave your hand, say aye. <laughs> aye. aye. OK, that sounded unanimous and looked unanimous to me, so. Um, updates is our next item. Um, Katie, did you have a couple updates you wanted to uh, bring up um, or Sarah? Yeah, so I think Sarah can um, share her update about the reimbursement um, and per diems. If she can hear us, I don't know. Did she come back on? <laughs> yeah, can you see Sarah? Not seeing her in the chat list right now. I said she's going to try to log off and back on. So I did see that Meg joined. So Meg, I don't know if you have any um, AAS updates you wanted to share um, or finishing of the boat launch steward season updates. Otherwise, I'll just add that there's going to be a public comment period starting for the draft disadvantaged um, communities definition that the basin program is working on. Um, and uh, Eric, you can fill in there, but the New York CAC is adding um, some time are setting aside some time on their uh, December 5th meeting agenda um, to uh, hear more about what went into that definition and sort of a 
that part of the meeting will serve as a, a public meeting for uh, that definition. So if uh, the Vermont TAC is willing to set aside some time on the December 12th meeting agenda, we can talk about more about that later when we're up to that agenda item, but um, that might be good to give um, the public a couple of different times of day to, to, to tune into a meeting that uh, describes that process in depth in addition to the written comment opportunities. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think that we could probably uh, slot that in as part of our agenda. Um, did Meg, is Meg live or Sarah live? I'm here now, sorry. Meg's here, just. Hi, Meg. Hi. I, I wondered if you just had a couple of minutes for a quick update on any AIS progress or, um, anything that's happened since our last meeting? Progress or anything that's happened since the last meeting. Um, we held a rapid response task force meeting last week. Um, we got results back from the last round of eDNA monitoring and trawling and electrofishing um, in the Champlain Canal. Um, the eDNA positive detects remain at the confluence of the Mohawk and the Hudson and up just below the lock C1 um dam there and um just as a reminder the canal corps is keeping the tainter gates that are in at lock c1 as late as they possibly can in the season um, and then they'll put them in as early as they can um, in the spring to help prevent a free-flowing passage for goby upstream um, quebec also ran their last round of edna collected in october and those were all negative for round goby as were the seining efforts in the richelieu river and the missisquoi bay um, i think that was their third effort in 2022 with no detects um, and then parks canada um, is engaged and involved and they're setting up um, and collected eDNA samples from within the Chambly Canal for the first time, which is great. Um, we're trying to integrate that into the planning for the 2023 field season. Um, the Basin Program Rapid Response Task Force has suggested using our Rapid Response Task Force funds to support the 2023 and 2024 um, early detection monitoring in the Champlain Canal portion. Um, so that's sort of the update there. And we also closed out the 2022 boat launch steward field season. Um, we had a really good season and I can, um, if you give me a second, I can probably pull up a slide with some numbers on it uh, if you want the preliminary summary. Um, but it was a good year and I think we're we're aiming in the next year or two to get another decon unit online on the Vermont side of, of the lake. Uh, I don't know what else for AIS updates. I think that's, I think that's where we're at right now. Great, thank you. Any questions for Meg? I do know that um, Julie Silverman has been in touch about a trip that she took down the Champlain Canal this late summer, um, and you know had some feedback and photographs and stories to share about her experience and you know identifying possible opportunities for increased outreach with the boating sort of the people from the boating perspective along the system for AIS outreach um, and I don't know if she's been in touch with you Mark but I, I said maybe she would want to get in touch with the CAC and see if they wanted to have a brief update from her about that experience as a lake keeper. Yeah, thank you. I I uh, I have been trying to connect with her, and we're actually meeting on Thursday, so I'll get some follow up from her. Um, she yeah, she reached out, and I forget her timing, but one big thing she shared is that the the lock keepers really said zero about what was going on, and referred them to the website, which it's kind of what we discussed, I think, at the steering committee or asked, you know, whether. Yep. The actual users were getting that key information, so um, we'll, I think we'll put the press on more for the start of next season. Yeah, and I think um, Eric Reardon, who's working with us as our AIS outreach coordinator along the, the Champlain Canal Corridor, has conducted some outreach with the lock tenders and provided them with round goby watch cards and information sheets. Um, and I think 
it's it's just it's not the first thing that the lock tenders or maybe at all something that they share with the boating public. They seem to be concerned with other issues. So I think we have an opportunity to improve working with the Canal Corporation on that. Yeah, thanks. Um, Sarah, did you get I don't see your oh, there I see you're connected. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Everyone. Sorry, I don't know what in the world was just happening, but I couldn't. I could see the blue windows lighting up with people talking. I couldn't hear a thing. Okay. I um, did I, should I give an update on um, the per diem process? Is yeah, I think that'd be great. We're right about that time of just doing updates, and Meg just shared her update on some AIS, and uh, Katie shared updates on the um, definitions and the public hearing process that the basin program is going through. So um, I guess you're on. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so hi, everyone. Yeah, it, um, I have sent Katie the um, personal expense um, claim form and she can most likely distribute it to the CAC. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward process. Um, each member can can complete it um, for per diem and any travel expenses attending meetings. Um, it asks for your social security number. The last four digits is fine. Um, and then um, we're gonna have everybody submit them the forms to, to Katie to compile um, every three months. Months. And so I, I know that um, we'll, we'll start this round with the end of November and then we'll do it again in um, end of January, um, April, July, and, and then move to October for next year. Um, that timing might be updated just per guidance from our business office to ensure that we're processing everything efficiently and timely, but I think this will work for now. Okay. Um, and the November um, submission can include um, summer CAC meetings and um, I think the May and June meetings as well, um, as well as the, the meetings that you've had this fall. Okay. Um, and then and then it'll be sent to, to Katie and then she will once, um, we're gonna try to have hold hold a deadline every three months or so so that way we um, can track our budget um, it'll be a first come first serve everybody all 14 members submitted for per diem we would probably run out of our annual um, CAC allotted budget um, that hasn't been the case in the recent past since I've been the coordinator um, so we'll, we'll just see how it goes and I can update you all as we progress through the year. Um, but it'll be good to have a, a deadline so that way any addition, um, surplus funds can get allocated towards some other um, things that um, I think Mark has talked to you about in the past. Like, um, well, it already includes printing the action plan and um, maybe some um, outreach materials or things like that. Great. Hey, Sarah, did you get any clarity? I think Senator Brock brought up um, and he thought that the legislators submitted reimbursement um, through the legislative reimbursement process, not necessarily through ours. Was there a clarity on that? You know, I can double check. I thought that when we checked we saw that in the past before my time there had been submissions um submitted through through us through the cac by legislators but i can i can double check i'm not 100 percent sure i'm not okay and uh last but not least did uh did you hear from the higher ups on whether they were going to roll over any of our last year's essentially unused budget I believe it has been approved, but I have not. I will follow up on that too to give you the 
official the official word mark. Thank you very much. Um, so two things I, I was at a active 50 district commissioners our annual meeting and introduction to the new chair and uh, two things popped up um, for our training. One was there was a wholesale adjustment to the per diem statute. Ours wasn't adjusted, but they did fix it. So it's a minimum, no less than $50 per day. Um, and then uh, commissions can petition the governor to increase. Um, so the governor can wrap that in through his uh, through his or her budgetary process at some point. The second thing, and I shared it with you all, was that we are all now subject to the state code of ethics. Um, technically, it went into play on July 1st, and it was supposed to be completed within 120 days. I don't believe that many people are meeting that 120-day standard. In the past, we signed uh, and an oath and uh, notarized. Now there's an online training. I shared the link and the statute, I think, with everyone. And so I think if everyone could try to go through that and get their certificate and just let, I think, Katie know that we can keep a tally that everyone has uh, received that certificate back through that uh, online training process. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Um, it's it's just um, and I think it's helpful in that it gives some clarity to conflict of interest, appearance of conflicts of interests and, um, you know, just sort of uh, same paging for most of the operations of state government and, and hopefully municipal government. I've been recommending that our, our local town uh, folks go through the same process just for clarity. Um, so if we could. Um, if everyone could sort of set that on there, maybe over a Thanksgiving weekend when you're doing nothing and have 50 minutes to go through the online training or something, um, that'd be great. And uh, and then please just let Katie know when you've received your certificate, get or Katie and I. Um, any other updates for now? I saw Kent join the meeting, so I don't know if uh, oh. you have any public comment. Welcome, Kent. Kent, are you live? I am sorry, I was uh, double tasking there and I just found the unmute button. I'm simply here. I want to listen in on uh, what's going on in the Cisco Bay. OK, I a comment. And I know Kent, your uh, friends in Northern Lake Champlain Annual meeting is Wednesday? Thursday. Thank, thank you. It is Thursday, uh, Thursday evening from six to eight, up at the Swanton Municipal Complex where we've held it for the last several years, and we'll be giving updates on our program, but also on the work that we're uh, reviving on the Rock River. Uh, we're trying to build on Project Rock and. Uh, trying to uh, really focus on one of the big contributors to the high phosphorus load in the Cisco Bay. Okay, well, maybe as we're discussing this next, if you, I guess, unless you wanted to do now, we've got a little time. Uh, would you like to provide a little bit of an update for us on on sort of hot issues and progress in Cisco before we segue into our, um, our or joint work with Pierre? Um, I just off the top of my head, um, I can tell you we've been sampling up there for the last 13 years. Um, we've been uh, getting the same results um, with the water sampling. We're asking questions about why doesn't the phosphorus load reduce? And we know that uh, we're trying to decide, trying to understand if there is legacy phosphorus that is being washed through the system despite the fact that farmers are adopting BMPs on the land. Um, we intend to go back and work with farmers one on one and find out what BMPs they trust and what they think is working for them. 
um, and we're there are some that are not compliant, and we would like to know why not, and maybe we can bring them some information from the farmers that are uh, adopting the practices and have trust in them. Um, we're uh, working with uh, Stacy Pomeroy, who suggested a new testing process um, in the ditches. Uh, we think there may be uh, quite a bit of uh, residue or legacy phosphorus in uh, the common ditching techniques that go on. They're getting washed out in these high flow uh, vents when we are finding our spikes in, um, in the movement of phosphorus um, into the Rock River. So that's, you know, we're going back to that work that's been that's been in place for a long time and we're trying to build on it. And we're looking at specific segments of the rock. And uh, this year we actually expanded the number of uh, areas that we're testing. And we found a couple uh, segments that are contributing more than others. And so that's gonna help us focus where we make our investment and who we're really working in that in that water basin. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Kent before we move on? Pierre? Yeah, yeah, okay. If my my mic is unmuted. Thank you, Kent. Uh, just just along the lines that you were saying, uh, it uh, we're not seeing any progress in the phosphorus measurements. And uh, this is very frustrating for farmers who uh, are uh, are doing a lot of actions and they don't, we can't tell them what the results are yet because it takes so much time for the system to react to, uh, uh, to see a reduction in phosphorus. So what we've been doing the last year, year and a half, we're doing the benthos health of benthic health of our uh, streams. We're doing the first portrait of uh, as many streams as we can in the watershed. And that is looking at uh, what lives at the bottom of those streams. And uh, apparently this reacts much m m faster if you see an improvement in the quality of the water and over two, three years, you could see an improvement in you know, the types of bugs that live there and the types of uh, you know, whatever lives there. And it can show measure improvements that you wouldn't see in the phosphorus reduction. So we're attempting to do that yet, to do that now. Um, Um, I would certainly love to uh, learn more about your results and we'll be sure to share with you too, Pierre. Another part of our program on Thursday night will be from um, Fitzgerald Environmental and they've done a hydrological study and uh, um, in the rock and we were actually supposed to work with them and do outreach to landowners, but um, their study happened during the time of COVID and we were really restricted as to far as far as what we could actually do out in the field. So, uh, but that that'll be wrapping up, and Joe Bartlett will be giving that presentation. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, moving on to our next item, um, we had some discussion at the retreat uh, at the request of Pierre and OVBVM to explore a joint letter from the Vermont CAC and uh, Quebec CAC OBVVM to request that the governments of Quebec and Vermont provide an update um, based on the cooperation agreement that was signed last year on uh, What's happening with with any uh, activities, their progress, the monitoring, et cetera? Um, we shared a draft letter that uh, Pierre worked on and I helped with, and then we also shared the um, 
the cooperation agreement that uh, we're, they're operating under. Um, if you had a chance to look at that short, it's about a four page document, but within that is a requirement for their first report to the Basin Program Steering Committee in 2023 and then um, every two years afterwards. And um, we noted that, but decided to remove it in order to really press the governments to provide public input so that public on both sides of the border are clearly aware and it's not a as perhaps a technical report as might be delivered to you know the more sophisticated audience of the steering committee so um i guess that's where we are with that i'm going to turn it over to pierre let him uh follow up perhaps and ask uh, or, or answer any other questions and then have some discussion um i would like a motion to approve the letter and move forward with that. I think we had a preliminary straw poll of approval, and I know that the New York CAC was also interested, um, uh, even though it's it's not necessarily in the New York CAC watershed. So, um, Pierre, do you want to go ahead? Katie, can you um, mute anybody else, please? What was that? Could you mute everybody else? I'm getting a lot of feedback from. Yeah, I think it's Pierre. So when okay. he starts talking, hopefully it'll resolve itself. Oh, if not, I'll okay. find it. <laughs> I'll start talking then. Uh, well, I'm just here to uh, to answer questions and provide clarification if necessary. I think the letter is pretty clear. I'd like to uh, thank Mark for uh, significantly improving my first draft and making it very a uh, pr uh, very professional letter. Um, so I'd like to hear from everybody else or uh, just answer questions. Uh, well, maybe I can add that uh, I talked to uh, Secretary Moore and I talked to Natalie Provo, who's the representative of Minister uh, Charette on the steering committee of the Basin Program uh, about um, month and a half or two months ago, just to tell them this was coming. And they were just happy with it, saying, well, we'll be ready, no problem. Uh, this is Carrie. Uh, I'm very much in support of this letter. I was at uh, working at DEC when the original agreement had expired. So this is, and tried to work to renew it back then. So this is a real promising opportunity for us and and with that I'll make a motion to support this letter as written. I'll second that Carrie Denise. Uh, thank you Carrie thanks Denise. Uh, are there any other well now that it's moved are there any other comments or questions on the text? or any other any substantive that we can share while we still have Pierre available? I only wanted to also extend my appreciation to Pierre's work. I thank you for playing that shuttle diplomacy in this role, and I, it's really exciting to see this uh, move forward. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, I have two two things to say. We, there's a small edit that needs to be done, and the last paragraph where it says both the ENR and MELCC. Now it's the MELCCFP. Since the election, there's been a slight reorganization, and uh, wildlife and parks are part of the old MELCC. Exactly that. And on the French version, because we worked on the English version first with Mark, and then I translated it to French and uh, just uh, on the protocol level we don't say dear secretary more we say uh, uh, madame la secrétaire and more a monsieur le ministre charrette I don't know it's up to you to leave it like that or change I don't know what's usual what's 
what's used in English. Um, well, we'll leave leave the French as you uh, as you know best, and perhaps Katie did that for you. <laughs> um, no, but I will I will update the first letter and send it back to you, Katie, for the records. Now we have to decide how do we send those. Uh, to uh, to each uh, uh, addressee and the attachment oh. the attachments as well. Uh, this is Carrie again. Wherever we have an abbreviation, I would also just appreciate writing out the actual uh, name of the entity with the abbreviation in parentheses. So upon those changes that Pierre had just described. In particular, the new, the new name from the reorganization. Um, my my motion still stands, uh, assuming those changes would would take place. Uh, I I personally prefer the dear secretary more in the English version, um, but it's uh, it's really up to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Carrie. Yeah, I'm I'm comfortable with dear secretary more and. Um, you know the what's what's appropriate in the French translation. Uh, we'll leave for Pierre. We'll make those edits and um, yeah, I noticed that too. So when we when we complete the um, lines, the address lines, um, we'll also add in the full name for the acronyms um, there. So um, I think that Pierre, we can. Uh, just make these edits and uh, and uh, we can send them both in English and in French to both parties um, with the attachments. And I think we're comfortable with that. And Katie and I can work on that with you if that's OK. That's OK with me. Uh, we usually send uh, send letters by email followed by a paper copy in parallel. Um, in the past, it was paper only. Now it's uh, now we have uh, everybody on on Twitter and uh, <laughs> things have evolved. So uh, yeah, emails. We'll, we'll do that too. Um, maybe we'll have to get a. Uh, in, in maybe at our next retreat, we'll decide a logo for the Vermont CAC so we can co-logo the next letter, Pierre. Yeah, yeah, it looks bad now. We just won. Oh, uh, it's, you, you guys have a great logo. Um, okay, any further discussion? Uh, my only question is we, we will be having a vote on this, right? Yes, that's where I'm moving to right now is oh, to thank you. want to make sure that we're done with any other edits or comments and then um, so except for some minor edits, as we've discussed, the uh, the letters are unchanged. Is there any other comment before we go to a vote? I just want to, I, I'd just like to add my thanks for all the work that went into this and I'm very, very excited about this. Thanks, Carol. Um, OK, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Pierre, thanks again for the work and the translation. And um, Kitty and I will will um, connect with you for digital delivery and mail delivery. OK. Thank you again so much, everybody. I think this is important and uh, we'll see you uh, when the meetings take place and prepare your questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Pierre. Uh, Mark, uh, you still be? No, I think we're good. We're just going to move into our action plan planning and organizing and begin to dig into some of the issues. And um, so unless you want to stay and listen in, we'll um, well, I'll see you in a couple of weeks and we'll try to get these letters out by the end of the week. You can do that, Katie.
OK, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and have a great work session. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, care. Bye. So um, it's that time of year to dive into our action plan. I know at the retreat we had some discussion. Mark, I think you just went on mute. Yeah, Mark, we can't hear you. Sorry. Um, so it's uh, it's that time of year for us to dive into our action plan and organize ourselves around that. I know that we had some discussions um, in prior meetings and at the retreat regarding some issues that might um, might rise to our attention and uh, others that are continuing conversations and continuing um, issues we want to press to the legislature. Um, there were a couple comments about possibly changing the format, so we can talk about that and we can actually dig into that again um, at our next meeting in December and hopefully we'll have uh, others. Um, I know Lori has all often participated in depth with it and Bob too, so and Wayne, so um, Hopefully uh, they'll be in attendance at the next meeting. We can dig into, uh, you know, sort of template and format a little bit more. Um, I guess first. Mark, uh, sorry, I saw Tom Barry joined. I don't know if he has anything he wanted to share with the committee oh. before we got too deep into this discussion. Uh, no, just logging on, logging on a little late. Uh, happy to be a fly on the wall for now. Great, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, so typically we've created a task force to marshal this piece of work along and um, do some of the work outside of our regular meetings. Um, in the past, it's been the vice chair taking the lead on that with you know three or four or five others. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk to Denise. I know that she's juggling a lot and I'm not sure whether she's available to do that this year to sort of take the lead. Um, otherwise, I'd like to get three to five people, and if we don't get everyone, all three to five now, um, that we can add in a few, um, you know, with some com with some discussions over the over the next week or so, as people follow up for, who uh, might not be in attendance today, um, to begin to work on it. So. Denise, can you hear? Are you live? Yeah, no, I'm here. I'm just not on camera. Okay. Um, I, and I'm trying to remember last month when we met Mark and you weren't here, we sort of talked about it being a committee project process. And, and we talked about how last year when we would send things out um, ahead of time, it was much better when everybody was in the same room together and we did kind of group editing which sounds terrible when you say it out loud but that um see that process seems better for us um i'm trying to remember and correct me if i'm wrong guys did we say that we wanted to do it within the cac meetings the edits in the next like november december so today's november december and get a final draft out um together as opposed to creating a small committee but i'm happy to do whatever the group group's wishes are that, yeah, that's what was discussed at the last meeting. Um, thinking about this a little bit, I think it would be good still to maybe have a small group to do some more of the wordsmithing. So maybe in the large group, just make sure we're covering the big topics and then, you know, get into some of the more painful editing details yeah. in a smaller group. Yeah. Now, now that I'm saying it out loud, it doesn't <laughs> sound like that much fun. But yeah, so do, uh, having a small group come together maybe between now and the December meeting after we kind of go through the topics tonight um, and and maybe Lori and Wayne or uh, others want to be part of that small committee but that that makes sense and I'm I'm I think we might have one or two meetings between now and the December one where we would have to come together or we could try to do it over email thoughts um i'm i'm game for 
for that. I think it's historically we've been fairly effective in doing some of the wordsmithing and narrowing things down and uh, developing consensus. And then when we do, um, you know, wordsmithing by committee, it's been reasonably clear and an opportunity for everybody to weigh in. And um, it's felt like we've had good consensus and good conversations to end up with a final um, a final product. Um, we talk about wanting to have less words and we haven't been very successful in that, but we still end up making it fit in two pages and with good images. And so I think that that's on par, unless we want to do make a dramatic change, I I don't see us uh, uh, making a huge change from the format or process that we've done in the past. Does that make sense? Yeah. Carol's hand is up. E yes, I just want to say I thought it worked well last year, and um, I really liked that we had a Google Doc to um, work off of that. I thought that was really great. Then we could make suggestions and blah, blah, blah. OK. Well, why don't we do that? Denise, um, can you yeah. marshal this? Can you take the lead on this? I'm I'm totally available to work with you, but um, it'd be great if if we had one other uh, member to really push this along. I can, yep, and I'll probably, I think next week is Thanksgiving week, so either the week after or the week after that, we could maybe try to do a Teams with the anybody who wants to be part of the small wordsmithing group, either email me or Katie or both of us. Okay. And we can set up a Teams meeting. And Katie, can you put the document in the Google? Yeah, I have it. I have it set up in a Google Doc now, um, and I'll reshare that um, okay. with the meeting materials. But I'll put it in the chat now for those of us who are here. Excellent. Great. Um, OK, so uh, I see Bob joined. Bob, did you have your hand up for a second there? Yeah, well, no, I've been here the whole meeting. Yeah, I had to say my hand up for a minute. The only change I would make, we do it every year, the same thing. It's kind of disparate. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the document. But as we go along, there's like maybe, you know, there's there are five topics or whatever, six. Maybe maybe there should be one sentence at the beginning or it could just be discussed when we went to meetings. These are the five topics we're going to discuss and anything else you wish to discuss, something like that. But that's all I have to say, because you kind of go along about you get to the last top. It's always invasive. It's number, you see what I'm saying? Maybe yeah. if we just one sentence at the beginning, but, you know, either way. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um. So I, I guess to get started, Denise, I'm just going to throw out a few things I had notes on. Um, apologies, I missed last meeting, but um, a, a few issues, you know, I, I always look back to what have we been talking about? What have we been pushing for? Have we been successful, um, et cetera? And um, there's uh two issues I think that are continuing that uh, perhaps deserve another push. Um, one is the ag water quality enforcement. It's been a perennial issue. Um, you know, as you know, we had a presentation on a pet petition from CLF and VNRC and the Lake Champlain Committee, and there may be one or two other petitioners with that. Um, I understand there hasn't been much movement, um, but it was clear that at least historically, to, to me, the agencies have sort of said we can we can do this together, we can do it and get along. And yet, in the petition, there was a letter from Secretary Moore specifically asking the governor to shift enforcement to DEC to provide that clarity. And I think that it's time, if uh, if the secretary, present secretary, wants it. Um, we should push extra hard for it. So that's one item in my comment on it. The second was AIS funding that, um, uh, you know, we heard from 
Oliver Pearson that the division was starved and and not really well staffed, um, sort of patchwork of uh, interns and and um, and uh, I'm sorry, what's the seasonal um, funding source? AmeriCorps and the AviroCorps um, folks and at our um, at our basin program steering committee, I think it was unanimous that the single greatest uh, threat to Lake Champlain is invasive species. And so, and and Secretary Moore was in fully engaged on that. And so it's it strikes me that us really pressing for additional budgeting and additional staffing. Um, for the AIS program uh, could be or should be a, an item. Um, we'll have updates. There was some discussion regarding foam in docks and containers and a potential ban on that. Um, I think that um, there may be a bill moving forward from Conservation Law Foundation. So it's something I think we should keep on our radar screen as we move forward. And then um, I think all of you receive uh, follow up regarding New York CAC meetings. I think everyone's on the mailing list. Is that right, Katie? I am not actually sure about that. Um, so it, all right, I've seen some head shakes, so I will update that. <laughs> OK, um, there was a presentation in the New York CAC regarding um, mandatory septic inspections around Lake George and some movement. And um, well, I think I brought it up at a prior meeting and I know Bob's has brought it up a number of times. The fact that, you know, well over half of Vermont are on septic systems. Um, and yet there's no mandatory certification of function, et cetera, et cetera. And in the last few years during COVID, I ended up spending a lot of time on the lake um, helping with a, a business friend with moorings and docks and, and that sort of thing and, and boat salvage. And um, so I had a chance to really be looking closely at shorelines. And just my observation is there's a lot of septic systems that are within the floodplain of the lake that at high water, there's no way that they can be functioning. And I can't imagine that they dry out to actually function as a septic system until way late. And then discussions with um, with Wayne and others, you know, this movement to utilization of Airbnb and uh, lakeside camps, um, they're vastly exceeding their their capacities when they're I don't know the I guess partied up. <laughs> they clearly are overloaded with lots of people on a weekend. And um, I'm not sure we have very good data on septic systems. Um, when we've asked previously, there hasn't been a lot of uh, solid data around it. And so I've been thinking whether we should dig deeper into that and possibly push for mandatory inspections on some reasonable period for people that are in the shoreland district. We have the Shoreland Act, and it seems to me that we might be able to add in for folks that are in that first hundred feet to every three years. I mean, there's no mandatory septic inspection even with a change of ownership. Typically, it's part of a inspection and report, and sometimes the, the mortgage company might require some some report that the tank has been pumped, but nothing really related to whether it actually functions and how it's used. Um, so those were a few items that uh, I had notes on and wanted to bring up for the initial part of our conversation. Um, Carrie, did you have your hand up? I have mine up. It's Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi. Um, I wonder if we should contact the Vermont Bankers Association and the Credit Union Association. I don't know what that's called, but and um, and ask about 
this topic, you know, to see if they think it would be, and, and maybe the title insurance people see what they think about um, when property, how we should deal with property transfers. And I agree that we should, um, that we should require inspections. Yeah, so just as far as title insurance and things like that, I, I'm not really the, the uh, including that as a mandatory part of a transfer, I think I would rather not in, have to engage the realtors and everyone else. I think it's just a function of if you have a pot of water supply permit, which means you have a septic permit, um, then every three to five years, it ought to be inspected and shown that it's actually functioning rather than waiting till it's failed. I think that there are a number, and I, I don't know the numbers on this, and I don't know if the agency has that data um, with parcel data in the GIS system of how many um, camps or converted camps along the lakeshore or homes are within the shoreland district and what is the status of their um, septic systems. I just know that here, like right where I live, I can count 40 or 50 uh, seasonal or year round residences that have septic systems that are less than 100 at less than 102 feet. And so during floods, they, they can't possibly be functioning. The tank might fill up, but they can't be functioning. And um, I have to imagine that surrounding the lake, there's um, there's similar situations. So I guess before we move to mandatory uh, inspections, I think there's some data that um, probably needs to be gleaned. And, you know, as we've moved, um, our action plan to look more than just annually, but to actually look to the biennium or beyond that um, it may be we're asking for, you know, better data, updated data if the, if the uh, agency has some data and um, getting back to uh, Get, getting updated and a better understanding of it. I know that historically the agency has said there's it's de minimis input of phosphorus nutrient load into the lake. And so we focused on higher priority, bigger bang for the buck um, solutions. Um, my sense is, is that if we truly are all in, then all contributions are important. Um, septic loads into groundwater or into shoreland and ultimately our surface waters are important too and it really forces everyone to be all in and uh, helps take away some of the just incessant finger pointing at ag although we know that ag is a significant issue um, so that's that's my thought carrie I don't want to interrupt. I want to um, comment on a couple of other things. OK. Um, so I I just wanted to put out a few of the things that I had in my notes, and I think this is an opportunity for everyone to share um, items, uh, issues that they, they think should be considered by the committee to um, get into our action plan. So Carrie, if you want to take it from there, that'd be great. OK, thank you. Uh, I want to first of all appreciate the attention to uh, aquatic nuisance species. I had heard from the head of the president of the Vermont uh, um, Federation of Vermont Lakes and Ponds that they anticipate actually uh, a reduction of um, of something on the order of 30 percent in state funding to support aquatic nuisance species prevention. And DC, DEC is now planning to outsource the entire administration of the program 
to a service provider. So this this is worrisome. We're trending, we're going in the wrong direction at the very time when we know the the ramifications of unchecked aquatic invasive species in our waters. So I want I, I appreciate continuing to make this a priority, and uh, and I anticipate really pushing hard on legislation to um, help rectify this this um, problem. So I I look forward to working with you all on that. Um, when we what when you were talking about septic, um, the one thing I want to raise is a, my continued concern about toxics. And we've um, the data is now showing that um, our biosolids from septage in particular <laughs> is a major PFAS source and uh, the, the per, poly, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances that have often been coined the forever chemicals because of their toxic contamination and the difficulty at actually removing the contamination and the high cost of that. Um, <clears throat> although research is showing some promising treatment, it's still um, the extent of, of potential um, contamination is substantial. So, I'm I'm interested from just a, when you talk about biosolids or septic management, <laughs> we also have to look at biosolids, and I'd like to see us moving all biosolid management to a class B because of it being a, considered a, a major source of or a, a source of um, a PFAS. And then that brings another interest to continually look at the concerns of toxics in our environment. PFAS being one of them, this, the leachate that we are collecting from the landfill in Coventry actually is being, some of it being carted out of the state, some of it being brought to wastewater treatment plants, and and they're finding that that toxicity of the of the leachate is interfering with the, the functionality of the wastewater treatment plants and meeting its uh, E. coli standards. So... <laughs> There's an unfortunate synergy um, occurring there. Um, so if I, I, I'm uh, like to see a continued focus on toxics in the environment and the need to stabilize funding for our environmental contingency fund, address the the toxics generally in consumer products, and um, and concern about biosolids and its potential spread on on farmlands. Gary, um, Hillary, and then uh, Bob, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love for you to weigh in on Carrie's questions, comments on the biosolids. I know you and I have had some conversations about that, and uh, so while we're while we're thinking about it, if you could follow up after Hillary, thanks. Bob, do you want Bob? Do you want to go first? Because mine's not a biosolid. Um, sure, I'll go first. Ah, <laughs> uh, great. Uh, so, um, so you can ban, you know, the biosolids on farms. So, first of all, the biosolids last last uh, last term here fell under the Department of Ag. Any any land application, there's no need for a bill or anything. You could actually just ban it through the Department of Ag more or less the application on farmlands any farmland amendment second of all like our my biosolids they generally don't go to farms at all um the wilston park and ride that's where they're at right now they're mixed in uh, uh eci uses them uh vtrans is uh has a uh, co-okayed them as a soil amendment because i mean they're being put under reclaimed as you know tire asphalt you know so that's a mo right so i'm not saying for or against uh, land application on farms. I'm just saying that it's a very small amount that actually goes to farmland. It's 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 quite small. Uh, septic is another, that's sorry. not what the, the, my bill is to actually reclassify all bio biosolids from a class any class A would become class B, and the only thing that triggers is a permit. Um. Okay. Interesting. That's interesting. Uh, because EPA is always pushing everyone to go the other way. I mean, it's on the federal level, they're 
pushing everyone to go to EQ biosolids. Um, so, um, first I've heard of it, I can't really, you know, sure, permit change. Everyone, there is hardly any class B left. There is no class B land application though. I mean, it's, it's virtually gone already. I think there's one septic site left that I know that the state still permits under Amen. You'd have to talk to the state, but they're down to one now. Uh, it all goes to wastewater treatment plants now. And a lot and a lot of that septage is actually higher in PFOS. That's why I shy, shy away from taking it in my facility. And, but in the event that all wastewater facilities were forced to stop taking it, that would be quite the uh, interesting scenario, which would would uh, only uh, decrease the output of anything from the wastewater treatment facilities such as mine. And I certainly would never be opposed to that. Um, Bob, I, I just I wonder. Um, so if. If ongoing. Septic system maintenance and the septage that's taken and then delivered, and if I understand correctly, typically it's dried out and becomes a either the soil amendment or it's trucked to Coventry. Is that the typical? So, so when you say septage, we I consider septage to be that which comes from septic tanks, which are is either brought either land applied or right. So um, no, it all goes to wastewater treatment plants. Almost all of it. There's hardly any land application of septage left. There's only one field left that I know of still and permitted. Um, so it, it all goes to wastewater. A lot of it goes to Richmond, um, places like that. Um, that's the whole thing. When one of them shuts down, they're already having huge capacity issues as it is on processing septage. My issue is that septage is higher. And and and, or, and I'm sorry, let me let's go to the more important point. So of the amount of land that, so, and also most of mine actually goes besides uh, the trans, it goes for uh, uh, mine reclamation, asbestos mine, et cetera, goes for top cover. And this is only like a, a 1% mix or so with other soils on it. So it, it's a nutrient, so it helps provide the you know, it's uh, carbon re sequestration. It, it puts 60% of the carbon back. And the phosphorus rather also goes back. Rather, I'm not saying there isn't other things like PFAS. The phosphorus goes back rather than importing it from the, uh, that's the that's the benefit of using it on farms is they're using phosphorus that is coming from people. Most of the phosphorus into a wastewater treatment plant comes from inside us. About the vast majority of it, we excrete in urine and comes to the facilities. Um, so the vast, the whole issue that what I'm trying to say is, is the amount of in there is concentrated, but septic tanks, there's no PFAS mitigation on septic tanks. That's called land application. The grass always is greener over the septic tank. Everything goes out. The septic tank, the whole entire state is being inundated with everything, microplastics and everything that comes from people through septic tanks over the entire state. So that's, I'm not telling anyone what to do about anything. I'm just laying out the facts as I know them. Any other questions? Um, I, I, I don't think so. I, I was just trying to get some clarity on the capac where, where, where septage is going. And um, it sounds like it's, I, I'm pretty sure well over 90% is going currently to wastewater plants. I'm I'm quite sure it's well over that amount. It is being probably it was quite a bit more, but they started shutting them down. Those fields along Richmond with the with the teepee there, as you go down 89 there. Um, <laughs> before that on the Bolton Flats, yeah, that was yeah they stopped. I think there they stopped them there and other places. You'd have to ask uh, Amen at DEC, but yeah, no, it's for sure. It's probably 95 goes wastewater at the moment. So, septage is going into wastewater treatment plants, and they eventually, uh, wastewater treatment plant biosolids are then used as soil amendment in what sounds like contaminated sites. That's often, that would be probably, yes, the majority of mine would go into, I don't know if I'd call a, a park and ride a contaminated site, but 
certainly a lot of it is contaminated mine reclamation, yes, um, currently in the state. There's not that much Class A produced. There's only like five, I think. There's, there's Middlebury that goes to a farmland. There's us. There's Stowe. There's like, there's just a couple. Uh, I think SS, everyone else just uh, landfills it. Burlington's the big uh, thing in the room. They Once they went from, a, they always were considered reuse because they went to Shattagay, even though it was just shipped out the door still to New York. But because I think it became cheaper, now it's just sent it to Coventry, it's all just going to Coventry. And once all their solids went there, so the vast majority of, of solids, of uh, bio solids, the sludge, which is, you know, something's got to come out of a wastewater plant. Everyone is um, the... Uh, is goes to the Coventry now currently and they mix up her top cover with the best stuff the rest of it's just land but there's increased off gassing then too and then there's huge greenhouse gases with trucking so that's once again i'm sorry but just there's no easy solutions if i have to suddenly stop doing what i'm doing i'm going to go from 39 dollars a wet ton to probably like 150 a wet ton and i'm not going to put any be able to money on other things like pfos mitigation on my filtration and whatnot i'll be so broke Nonetheless, besides that, I can absorb that. It's just there's going to be huge greenhouse gases as those trucks take that stuff to Quebec or wherever it's got to go, and the cost is only going to go up. Um, so, right, those are all, there's plenty of other issues. I'd like to hear what Eric has to say. Did Eric say something? I was just thinking, thanks for that super uplifting report, Bob. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. Oh, I met the other Eric too, the farmer. Right. Let's see what he oh, has. Eric. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, both. No, I'll I turn just, over the other Eric. <laughs> no, it's just that the farmland application is done. I, I don't know of a place around it is. Um, that's that's off the board now. So yeah, and. You know, you thanks, Eric, because actually I had to give the new ES speech at the Green Mountain show. And I said my theme was doomed. Actually, after I did all the inflation and all the other issues, I, you know, I, but I was just joking. It was actually one water. I, it was a joke. But I, that was actually what I said, doomed. So, yes. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Um, so, Bob, one, just one last. If I'm hearing you correctly... Essentially, any of the toxics, including PFAS, that are ending up in septage are ending up in wastewater treatment plants and ultimately ending up at Coventry, where we have significant PFAS leachate problems. And yes, alternatives all have dramatically negative greenhouse gas externalities because we're trucking the problem to someone else. Is Correct. that the sum yeah, of it all? So Yes. And also, as all those septic tanks, each one has to be serviced by a diesel truck as it goes on and on and on. That's why I'm once again for building in. I would agree. I think CLF and everyone would agree with me on building in because I can put anything on my facility as a filter at the end. Sometimes it's ungodly expensive. But as you build in, you build in. I mean, you know, on the space station, water's 8.34 pounds per gallon. They don't send water up. The perspiration, the pee, everything goes through membrane filtration, okay. everything circled you know that's it okay gloom <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, no, no there's plenty of good stuff there's all sorts of technologies coming around there is you know we're uh, you know we're starting to produce energy some of there's one plant in in like denmark that does 1.5 the energy there's a, this is all carbon coming down it's sort of like the same thing with the back to the future where he throws the where he throws the banana peels in these are all carbon sources that will be utilized in the future, and there'll be metal reclamation and everything else. Hmm. Okay, Hillary, thank you. Thanks, Bob. I'm sure you guys have no idea what I'm going to comment on, but um, <laughs> the joke. Um, so I guess I'm. I would be interested to know, like, am I the only one who doesn't think it's a good idea for for egg enforcement to go to DEC? Because I think it's like a really not good idea. And I think I've like I've said that before. And I just I guess I would just think that if we're going to ask for that, a it would be interesting to see if Julie Moore still wants to do that because I heard that she rescinded that 
letter, um, although of course there could be politics involved. Um, and I think Agency of Ag does a creditable job with enforcement. There definitely can be pretty scary when they're on the farm. Um, I've worked with both enforcement, you know, at Agency of Ag and DEC. And, um, you know, I haven't seen DEC to be better. It's more confusing to have that dual, certainly the dual enforcement. Um, so I guess I would ask that, you know, I, I didn't see a lot of facts facts or science in that CLF presentation. Um, I guess I wasn't swayed by it, but maybe nobody changes their mind ever. So maybe I'm the only one who feels this way and nobody else on the CAC will ever change their mind. They'll always feel that it should go to DEC. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I would be in, like, I would just, are we willing to go and ask people on the ground who work with farms what they think? Because I think I just think we should at least take that step because I don't think anybody on the ground working with farms thinks enforcement should solely go to DEC. And also Act 76 was Julie's idea too. And just because an idea is Julie's doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. Hmm. But we're not gonna put that in the minutes, right, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> we'll just slice that out of the recording. <laughs> um eric yeah there's a lot that i agree with what hillary said um and uh also i think as far as the quote investigation that was done on the, the agency of ag if that same intensity of ag of uh investigation had been done on uh on dec from what i'm saying we are some of our ag community has seen and issues that are semi-related to ag um you know the rescinded permits and all the uh, issues that goes on with the um personnel within dec um i have to agree with with hillary um and uh, i know I, I i i did vote for it last time um but uh there's a lot of thinking since and i i have to side with with hillary it's really uh uh it's we're just in my mind we're just opening up another nightmare thank you thanks eric um any other discussion on on the uh ag water quality enforcement issue for now uh this is carrie <clears throat> I, th I do think we, we can all recognize that there is a breakdown in communication between the agencies, or at least that's what we hear in through the grapevine. And it would be, I think, helpful for us to figure out <laughs> how to bring the agencies together for this common cause of clean water uh, for future generations and viability of farms for future generations. So. I, I don't know what that looks like, but I just want to at least acknowledge that um, I think that we have an opportunity before us as the Citizens Advisory Committee to see how important it is for agencies coming together with that all-in approach to um, to address these issues in a, in a, with a collaborative spirit and an honest honest dialogue. So um, I, I just mentioned that and uh, welcome, I don't have any answers, <laughs> but I, I welcome um, all our thinking and heads together and, and support of, of something along those lines. Eric? So um, just for some clarity, uh, the ag community um, <clears throat> considers it to be enough of a problem. So some of our organizations are actually asking the agency personnel and the DEC personnel to come to our farmer meetings for a, a question and answer to exact to answer what Carrie is talking about, because we know there is a problem. And oftentimes what we what we see is that it's a it's a personnel problem 
and oftentimes it's within each of those organizations. It's not necessarily between organizations, it's within the organizations. And the other thing that we have to acknowledge is there's a lot of personnel turnover now, and that is creating problems on the farm. <laughs> so it's it's not an easy it's not an easy program or not an easy problem to solve, and it's even harder to really understand what the problem is. But the ag community is um, our Champlain Valley Farmer Coalition. That's what we're. That's one of our main things now is we're. Eric, you're on mute now. Eric, we're not able to hear you. Sorry. So I guess I've done my thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> we 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 missed about a minute of it, Eric. It seems like I, I, everything went to mute for some reason. It's, it's just that we're the, our organization, our Champlain Valley Farmer Coalition, we're just working diligently to figure this thing out and how we can get clarity from each of those uh, those organizations or agencies. And uh, and it's not easy. It's uh, um, we're just ha trying to come up with clean water and and uh, have a have a life on the farm as well. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thanks, Eric Carroll. Thank you. Well, I keep hearing the same issue that there isn't enough talking, the same issues, talking, people aren't all on the same page, we aren't working together, whether it's between, among, whatever. What if we were to suggest that people come together for a mediated session to figure out, or, you know, to figure out what, what it is that that people's you know vision and mission is and then and, and figure out how we can accomplish what we're trying to accomplish which is clean water which is not only what we need but um but you know if you think about the affordability for vermonters of not doing the right thing as soon as possible because we're going to end up paying more later than now if we get it right now if we make the changes now. So for affordability and the environment, I think that I don't know who the people are who aren't getting along. And I kind of think that we should make everybody who is responsible or possibly responsible sit down together. Because this is, I don't, I mean, I'm okay with putting it over to DEC, period. But maybe when it goes there, the people who've been doing it at a and and the people who are going to do it at DEC can start talking to each other about their experiences and, and where to go next. Because I just don't see, unless people sit down with goodwill, how we're going to move through and move forward. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Carol. Hillary? Yeah, I just, I guess I wanted to say that, you know, if we say we look into what the Champlain Valley Farmer Coalition is doing and what, what their ask is of the agencies, and we agreed that it would be good to see this, you know, conversation play out, like, it could be a really powerful partnership to have our group partnered with the Champlain Valley Farmer Coalition to ask this, you know, this question or this task of these two agencies. Um, just maybe something to think about. Maybe that would help move the needle if we were aligned with, uh, you know, a group like that. Um, yeah, thanks, Hillary. Uh, Carrie? I can only imagine they've they've tried to hold a number of meetings. Um, and I, I appreciate this conversation. I also greatly appreciate the work of Farmers Watershed Coalition to bring people together and have those conversations and rebuild and restore trust. I think um, what's missing here 
are the um, indicators or performance indicators where they can monitor that kind of Im um, improvement over time. You know, some of the breakdown, as I understand, occurs with um, delays between um, finding a violation and when it's reported or delays in identifying even whether something is a discharge or not. Uh, and and all that is, I think, a function of just that, um, I think, lack of being able to either communicate better or create those indicators of um, to show performance over time. And so I, I, I just, um, you know, just wanted to shed a little bit more of my, my limited perspective on it. And, um, <clears throat> but I think the more we, instead of sweeping it under, under the rug, I, again, I, I think what Eric is mentioning is um, fantastic as a, a real important continued step forward for this, these common goals. And, um, and I, 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 you know, to the extent to which we can support that and support that conversation, support the development of a performance agreement of sorts to kind of, you know, eyes wide open, laying everything on the table, how are we going to move forward? And we have options, obviously. And I think we all want, to the same outcome. It's just um, that lack of trust that we need to somehow figure out how to restore. Thanks, Gary. Eric? Yeah, I just um, sometimes in in a conversation like this, um, there seems to be a uh, in uh, like an underlying feeling <clears throat> that uh, that progress hasn't been made. And I just like to say that that's um, f far from the way it really is. Um, if you go on the farms and you talk to the farmers and you see what they're doing and you understand the methodology that they're using, I, I personally think you'll be impressed. And so to, to go about this is this is negative and this is negative and we're not getting anything done because of this, uh, it's, it's totally, it's totally wrong. And so again, our organization, just because I'm involved in it, that's what I talk can, can talk about. Um, it's all proactive. It's all going out there and seeing what we can do, what we can afford to do. And uh, we actually are meeting with, a, with uh, the agency of ag and DEC. Uh, I don't know the date, but it is in December. We have that meeting set up um, and uh, we do have a new executive director and we do have a do, new uh, program manager in our organization and uh, we're just moving forward. But uh, just please don't have this idea that we're not making progress because what we've done in the last five years, 10 years, whatever you timeline you want to put it on, um, it, it outperforms any other sector in the state. And so that's, that's my, uh, that's my spiel. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it's definitely not an easy uh, issue to resolve. It's been perennial. It's been going on for as long as I've been on the CAC. And it's sort of this chronic two dysfunctional agencies in their operations internally and externally. And, and um, uh, um, I guess one of my perspectives is if it was punted to one and only one had to deal with it, then we could try to resolve the dysfunctionality in only one agency rather than the other. Um, I do really, I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea, and if I understand correctly, that, you know, the Farmers Coalition having these meetings, and if it's continued, and asking uh, staffers from both agencies to show up and bring clarity and consistency to how they are functioning. Um, that's, you know, in my mind, perhaps a better attempt at a resolution than a directive from the legislature. Um, uh, and, you know, we know that there's been a lot of progress being made. Um, 
the issue is is it fast enough and are we doing are we getting the best bang for the buck on the on the uh on the sort of hot spots that we should be confronting and and i would expect that that's where enforcement actions are are uh being undertaken um you know the politics obviously are strong and i don't know whether secretary moore retracted that letter or not but um it, seeing that the letter and the date of the letter and uh, that request and the details on the interagency mediation that was attempted a few years ago and that it, it it just failed. And I think that's the performance is the performance of the agencies doing their job, not necessarily the performance of progress of farmers moving towards clean water, that that's that's the bigger issue. Um, but I also know that you know, Eric heard from from uh, Secretary Moore and the Ag Agency that they just um, they needed a nudge to to be pushed to to play better together, and it, it still hasn't happened. And so, I, I'm not sure whether the CAC continuing to say just push it one way or another, and you know, the petition. I'm. It's not clear to me that the the EPA is going to want to step in <laughs> and get involved either. Um, they're going to tell the state to get it together. And I, I, again, I don't know what that looks like. But um, I'm, like I said, I guess I'm encouraged that that the Farmers Coalition is pushing both agencies to fix their dysfunctionality so that the farmers can actually move forward affordably to find uh, solutions for clean water. Um, and the alternative, I'm not sure that we can do anything other than sort of push and say, hey, look, one or the other has to has to drive this boat. It can't be this co-mingled enforcement. It's just been failing. It's been failing for 10 years and we keep hearing about it. So um, I guess we'll keep having this conversation, but I, I don't think it's an easy res resolution. Um, Carol, did you have your hand up? Well, I did, but you know, I think if it's part of, if it's a person, to the extent it's a personnel issue, it has to be part of performance reviews. Either, you know, this is expected of you, figure it out. I, the whole state, our whole environment, and the farmers are, and all of us are all waiting on how many personalities is this? I mean, this is just, it's not fair. It's not fair to Vermonters. It's not fair to farmers. It's not fair. Yeah. Well, I think that was Carrie's notion with the performance metrics. And and um, so I think perhaps we can glean a little more information between now and the next meeting and, um, and maybe get some more feedback from how the Co Farmers Coalition, Hillary and Eric, how you're feeling that that is there being progress in the functionality of the enforcement program? Um, so, um, let's see. It's six thirty. I want to keep moving on. Are there any other um, topics or items that people would like to bring forward for consideration for the action plan? Toxics, ag water quality, uh, invasive spe aquatic invasive species, um, septic biosolids, toxics, leachate. Um, those have uh, those have been discussed. Um, historically, we've talked about continued investment in um, recreational access. Uh, particularly on the South Lake. Um, I know Senator Bray was interested in Otter Creek, and I think we heard from Fish and Wildlife that um, they were trying to do some planning around improved access along a paddleway and uh, other sites along Otter Creek. Um, any other thoughts or ideas? Carrie? A couple. 
Uh, one is is uh, ongoing thinking. I don't ha again have any solutions here, but the biodiversity crisis is still concerned. So the con continued focus on nature-based solutions to build resilience and achieve greater um, protections for our biodiversity may be a worthy objective or outcome or, or um, priority for us. Um, and with with Tom on the phone, <laughs> I would love to also raise the idea of a green bank of sorts, as we know that there's quite a bit of discussion at the national level about uh, using green banks to coordinate local investment, whether it's on environmental justice perspective, but it's clean water based, it's infrastructure, it's um, it can be nature based, uh, it's um, it's dealing with aging infrastructure. It's kind of rebuilding, you know, clean energy grids um, or building clean energy grids. So uh, I know in Vermont, we're kind of unique in that we have lots of different players all <laughs> somewhat engaged in. in uh, you just went on mute, Carrie. I, I don't know how much, why is it keep doing that? <laughs> yeah, Teams has been weird today. Um, I heard no one Maybe when have I a lot of a players. Level of tolerance <laughs> <for speaking. laughs> anyway, I throw the idea of a, a green bank concept as a coordinated effort to um, make sure we're efficient with our dollars, we're um, very um, visible to the public on in terms of accountability, we're targeted. We can maximize the multiple benefits we try to. Uh, we're interested in achieving, and I think it's uh, it's on the cusp of, of I think focus in in federal legislation right now, and using this mechanism as a means of uh, leveraging and addressing uh, critical needs. So um, I, I throw that as as perhaps a, an opportunity for us to scratch our heads about. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Yeah, I don't know why it, it, the team seems like it just automatically mutes everyone randomly. There's something funny going on. Well, if you hover, if you, my cursor was intentionally away from the microphone. So if, I know if you hover it over it, sometimes it automatically <laughs> puts that line through the, <laughs> the microphone. But. Well, why couldn't it do that to me? I think everyone would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe Bob, maybe you do that to me. <laughs> well, I hope not. I don't think so. <laughs> um, Karina, can I put you on the spot for a second? And I, I don't know whether I attended one of the Water Caucus uh, meetings, some initial conversation about some legislation discussions, and I don't know if there's anything. Often we hear from Lori, who shares with us um, sort of what's on her mind and what we might be paying attention to. Do you have any indicators you might be able to share with us on what's happening? I met with John Groveman the other day, but we were talking about a few other things. Yeah, happy to. Um, and I think these all fall on the water quality bucket, but can you guys hear me first? Yes. OK, um, we are working on a chloride reduction bill um, and that um, basically arose out of the great presentations at the Lake Champlain Research Conference this summer um, with the data that they've collected on the New York side of the lake in the Adirondacks and Lake George. Um, some pretty like scary results as far as chloride contamination, both in groundwater and surface water. Mirror Lake being the most contaminated. Um, so just wanting to set up um, a program to track the amount of chloride we're using in the state and um, educate and outreach related to chloride and the impacts of chloride. So um, the bill is still just an outline, but that's one thing we've been working on. In addition to that, we're working on a riparian and 
and Hillary's been a part of these conversations related to a riparian buffer and river corridor bill and trying to combine um, that work um, into one bill versus two. We've gone back and forth on that. And um, we have a draft that we are discussing and reviewing um, tomorrow or tomorrow, I think. So that's exciting. And then um, and then uh, related to the wetlands program, um, there is um, a budget increase for wetlands mapping. So that's a rule change in the wetlands program for improving um, our baseline data of wetlands in the state so that we have less um, violations of like people who didn't know that they had a wetland in their backyard and put a house up or put a septic system. So just collecting our data as far as where the wetlands are in the state is really inaccurate. So improving that data to have a better baseline of wetlands in the state. So that's a rule change that's going on um, right now. And there's public meetings. Actually, the next public meeting is tomorrow related to that rule change. And um, and then we have a, a wetland bill that supports that that mapping and those updates and reporting related to that. So, uh, Karen, is that a budgetary request to increase funding for the for the, the yeah, yeah. budget was Just, approved? So that request went through. So so the funding is there, um, but yes, part of this bill includes additional funding to uphold that program. And I don't know if you see Eric Howe had a question whether you were connected with Chris at, L, at the Sea Grant on the chloride reduction bill, or I guess Chris is uh, who's stepping in for her while she's on maternity leave, right? Sabbatical or sabbatical. Sorry. Yeah, so um, to answer Eric's question, Jared's been um, the lead on this, Jared Carpenter, and he has been working with Chris and um, I'm looking at a draft bill right now with Chris's comments. So she's been Perfect. part of it, which is great. Awesome. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions related to those updates? Carrie? Yes, um, thank you. Thanks for that. A couple of questions. What is the status of the um, functioning floodplains initiative? And is that, uh, do you anticipate that um, combo? I, I was the sponsor at last session on the riparian buffer bill, but knowing that we had a potentially a river corridor bill out there um, and the functioning floodplains work out of UVM was was critical, was a critical component to that. So if if you have any any updates on that, that would be helpful. I don't exactly know where we are with the floodplains initiative, but Mike Klein has been at the table with us in trying to intertwine these two bills, the the floodplain and the riparian buffer. And so what we have drafted now um, is is in his lap for review and comment. Um, but I am curious where we are in the flood, functioning floodplain process, so I don't have the answer to that. Uh, thank you. And then uh, I guess my other question was in regards to um, the dollars for wetland mapping. I thought we had put in last year um, adequate funding for the, we were told it was an adequate f amount of funding to complete the mapping of the state. Um, was that was did we yes that the funding for the mapping was is adequate what we're asking for based on communications with laura lapierre at the wetlands office is additional funding to support staff for the reporting requirement that we're asking for in our bill so so yes have the mapping but then we need the annual reporting to identify how many wetlands you know what is the increase in wetlands as far as the baseline of mapping how much impact are we having and 
a detailed report basically showing the impact, what type of habitats impacted, what type of wetlands, and and who who's who's completing those impacts and what we're restoring as well. So enhancing as well. So we're looking for just more detail as it relates to wetland resources. Thank you. Karina, thanks a lot for that. That was great, Sarah. Hey there, I was just going to um, offer a high level update on the functioning floodplains initiative from. From where I sit, um, and this is a little this is already a few months old, so I'm sure they've made more progress, but the connected connectivity scores are calculated for all of the sub reach spatial units. Um, project identification has been completed for the um, subreach spatial units. The tracking system is under development, and I believe the methodologies to estimate phosphorus load reductions for floodland, floodplain and wetland restoration is complete. And then the outreach tools and training modules are in progress as well. Hope that's a little bit helpful. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Just know we had a great presentation at our Act 250 District Commissioner Training Day from Stephanie and uh, a couple others in the Rivers team. They brought the um, the watershed floodplain bo boxes and put everybody through their demonstrations of here's a here's logs and here's your bike path and build it and see what happens which is really great i've done them a number of times but there was a lot of um a lot of focus on functioning floodplains so um it was interesting that that was uh um, a really key topic for uh commissioners as they're considering projects and uh development within the within or adjacent floodplains and exactly what the process is for mitigation um, or managing them um, seemed seemed fairly fairly well put together um, any others Carrie I, I think um I, I was Really excited to see the passage and the signature on the environmental justice bill. <clears throat> I think that's just the beginning of a, an important initiative. And I think the more we can um, continually support that, whether it's it's uh, I know there's there's some resources for mapping, some for community engagement related to the mapping, but but for a rural state to be able to um, look at the whole issue of of uh, underserved communities and neighbors with neighborhoods and within communities, I think is an important one. And and it gets to something that Mark you had mentioned early on about um, an ongoing interest of the CAC on public access, um, equity related to public access is I think a a related and um, opportunity there as well. So I, I just I don't know what that would look like other than um, a uh, continued, you know, attention to um, equity issues pertaining to clean water and our the priorities of the CAC. Yeah, th thanks, Carrie. Um, I think that um, at least from what I've heard and understand is um at least within this both states and the basin program and the federal partners there's a lot of um work going on to have definitions of disenfranchised communities impacted communities other so to meet the uh justice 40 um our environmental justice bill and how the agencies and programs will function in their spending that uh, really focus on these environmental justice, equity, 
diversity issues. Um, uh, I think Katie noted that there's a public comment period for the some of this definitional work coming up and we'll have an opportunity to discuss that um, at our next meeting in December. Um, uh, I think getting this alignment is critical and then as soon as that is there, it seems to me then there's sort of a race for implementation and opportunities to do some really focused efforts on public access, uh, various other programs, um, and really be sure that uh, our dollars and our resources are being allocated appropriately. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to sort of getting past this uh, process point so that most of uh, most of the jurisdictions are at least there's some alignment and we can really start to move forward with how are we going to see things on the ground getting done and some of the change that we seek. So um, uh, I think it will continue to be a focus for the CAC and I think uh, as we dig into it over the next few meetings and as um, sort of the realities of the agency uh, settling in and and uh, the feedback we'll get from uh, the basin program and how how they're working on it. Uh, there's been a lot of great work to date and I think more to come. So um, agreed. Eric. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and uh, just to quickly follow up on that. So we have been working uh, internally with the um, Basin Programs Executive Committee, which I know Carrie is a group you know well, um, they're meeting on Wednesday this week to look at um, some uh, def the, at some hopefully some final well not final but draft definitions that we can then issue for public comment. Um, we're not required to put them out for public comment, but I thought it would just be a good way to engage with public groups about these definitions that we'll be using. And then the steering committee will review them in December and we'll submit them to EPA for approval um, by the end of the calendar year. That's our required timeline. We've been, um, let's call it patiently waiting for the EPA to give us some guidance for four or five, maybe even six months now on this. Um, and we can't move any of our uh, infrastructure funding, which is seven and a half million dollars or so out the door until we have these definitions approved. So uh, once we have these definitions um, approved by the EPA, then we'll launch our suite of RFPs that are on in a, kind of in a holding pattern until then, and we can start rolling out more more grant opportunities. Thanks, Eric. Um, so we're co coming close to the end of the meeting. I wanted to follow up on some initial uh, uh, comments regarding our committee or task force and then uh, template and format. So Denise has agreed to take the lead on this. I know she's left, but we'll follow up afterwards. Um, are there any of you who would like to be part of the task force that will be um, doing some of the interim wordsmithing and um, corralling the rest of us to provide comment and input and and um, start pulling the action plan together. C Carol, are you raising your hand for a comment or to say yes, you want to be part of the team on the task force? Oh, um, well, last year I was, and I would be happy to do that again. But the reason I raised my hand is because the last speaker. What I wanted to say is, um, is there a w is it possible to get help from uh, one of our the offices of our congressional delegation so we can get these RFPs out so we don't lose the funding. <clears throat> Thanks, Carol. I am hopeful that uh, I have a check in with the EPA on this tomorrow. We'll see where, where they're at. But I think that um, at this point, they're pretty close to finalizing their guidance to us. Um, and uh, then we can we can move forward from there. If if there's still a delay, then yeah, I might uh, reach out to our representatives from our congressional delegation and have it, see if there's anything that, that they can do. This is all at the headquarters, EPA headquarters office. It's not our regional offices. So my, my typical 
the typical typical folks that I work with um, at EPA in the regional offices are are also waiting for clear guidance from from headquarters. Um, and I will say that we our draft definitions are based on the uh, uh, some of the information that's in the uh, Vermont bill that was passed earlier this year. Uh, so it's very heavily reflecting that that, that language. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thanks. So um, Carol has offered up to be part of the task force as last year. Is anyone else that um, is willing or interested in participating in that subgroup? Um, we'll follow up from this meeting with a request for any other members to reach out to um, Katie, Denise, and uh, me um, for that role. but before we wrap up this meeting and step into quick discussion about our next meeting. Um, if anyone else has the time to be able to spend on that, that'd be great. Um, I'll be participating with it too. So we'll um, we'll reach out to Lori and Wayne and others to um, to be part of that. Mark, I'm happy to to participate as well. Thanks. Thanks, Karina. Um, so next is our just sort of quick preview for our December meeting. Um, it will be December 13th. Katie has already sent out the invite. We'll have some, uh, you know, meeting minutes from tonight. We'll have um, a update and a discussion on the uh, opportunity for public comment on the definition definitions that uh, Eric was just discussing and uh, we'll follow up on the interim work of the task force on the action plan and um, obviously you all will have received um, a working document in the interim but our, our primary focus will be to try to pull together the action plan um, in time for our January meeting and final review print and planning for the legislative day. And um, I think that, uh, well, it w has worked in the past really well that we've had these hybrid meetings and been able to join a lot of people together and the, the legislature um, or, or members have have found a groove in in that sort of connectivity. Um, I will say it's it was nice to have some meetings FaceTime and I'm hopeful that we'll have an opportunity to maybe have um, a meeting at the at the state house. Um, but I also have a concern that things will be flaring up again with people running around and not wearing masks as much as they used to and they'll be upper respiratory diseases floating around that people might want to stay zoom connected and and not necessarily get into um, densely populated meetings in buildings so um, we'll talk more about that at december as it becomes clear and start making plans um, for committees as though that committee makeup starts to take shape um, I know leadership is working diligently to start to build those committees with so much turnover at the legislature. Um, I guess one other comment is that I, I understand that that some of the organizations are thinking about uh, sort of legislator training days almost to just to try to help new legislators get up to speed on various water quality related issues and so um, it may be that we we might have an opportunity to participate in some of those, um, at least in regards to the CAC's function. So keep an eye on that. Um, did I, I see someone's comment. Did I say the 13th? Yeah, the, so it's on the 12th. The 12th, sorry. Yeah. Um, so we'll see everyone on the 12th. Um, and does anyone have anything else before we close for the evening?
Colleen? Yeah. Um, hi, Mark in the group. I just wanted to announce that tomorrow the basin program will be issuing four different requests for proposals totaling about $750,000 for <laughs> education and outreach projects uh, for the Streamwise program that you heard Lauren speak about a month or two ago, and also for capacity building grants for watershed organizations. So be on the lookout for that announcement and please share it uh, with your peers who may have an interest and please know that uh, we are always looking for grant reviewers. We'll have at least one round, probably the first uh, week or so of January and another round of grant reviews uh, the first week of February. So please be in touch if you'd like to help. Thank you. It's all anonymous. Thanks, Colleen. We'll, uh, we'll put a reminder and uh, uh, link a contact for you when the, uh, when the follow-up goes out from this meeting for folks to be potential reviewers for those. But thanks for the update. We appreciate that. Um, we're at the bewitching hour. It's after seven. Uh, thanks again for everyone for a great discussion. Um, look forward to seeing you all in person again, but we'll definitely be in conversation over the next month and see you on the 12th. Thank you so much, Mark and everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.